I'd like to thank you for inviting me on the show. It's such an honour to be here and I'd just like to say that when I'm not playing Xbox with my mate Thor, I really like to listen to my favourite podcast, Pop Culture Pasta. Hey Dave, I'm thinking about doing another revolution. Do you want to join up? I might need some help with organising the pamphlets though. Pop Culture Pasta So Cody, I've spent the last, I don't know, at least few years of my life trying to be more curious and less judgmental. It's a bold move. And I've learned I learned it all from a TV show. A TV show that makes me want to be a better man. My name is Earl. <laughs> also my name is Earl, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> Maybe the, the only TV show that I've ever th- thought impacted my view of the world. Ted Lasso saved my view of the world, Cody. I thought, man, if we can make a TV show like this, that's not cynical. It's hopeful. I thought, well, man, we can do anything. We made murder, she wrote. <laughs> they were always hopeful that Jessica would catch the killer. I, honestly, if Angela Lansbury was alive, I'd vote for her for president. Ayo. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That wasn't a joke. <laughs> I would I would take Angela Lansbury for president. She was an American, so she couldn't run. I know. I know. She was a Brit. She reminds me of my grandma. She was a grandma, so. <laughs> uh, hello. Welcome. This is Pop Culture Pastor, the podcast. My name is Dave. Cody is here. I am celebrating it, Ted Lasso's return. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I don't know. It, nothing that could happen the rest of this month. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't finish that sentence. Don't you dare. We're riding high. (laughs) We're riding high. And I was about to make a bulletproof statement. And then I thought, yep, I don't believe in jinxing things, but I don't want to jinx it. You know what I'm saying? Ted Lasso season four. I think it's fair to say it hasn't officially been greenlit. There has been no official statement. However, they have signed, and this is this is for sure, Warner Brothers Television has secured the rights to bring back three original Ted Lasso cast members contracted under the Asius, I don't even know how to say that word, I don't know why you'd use that word, of the UK Acting Union Equity. I was going to say it's the Screen Actors Guild for the Brits. Yeah. So the three actors in question for a potential season four Ted Lasso Hannah Waddingham, who plays Rebecca, Brett Goldstein, who plays Roy Kent, Hercules, <laughs> yeah, him too, and Jeremy Swift, who plays Leslie. So it would, Diamond Dogs, Diamond Dogs mount up. It would appear that things are in motion that Ted Lasso season four is going to happen. Yes, although there has been one probably confirmed casualty: Phil Dunster, who plays Jamie Tart. Do 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 do. Jamie Tart. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's not been picked up because presumably there's a conflict he has with the shooting schedule because he is on a couple of other shows now because they all I mean, a lot of them blew up. Danny's like in Marvel movies. Um, <laughs> Very bit part, but he's still in. He it. just was in a picture with Jake from State Farm and Patrick Mahomes. Wow. I yeah. saw that today. So, yeah, I'm very excited for the possibility of a Ted Lasso season four. What could they do with the story that would make you dread a season four of Ted Lasso? There's there's one thing in my mind in particular, but I wanted to ask you first. Oh, there's a million things they could do that would make it awful. You're going to scare me now. And would ruin your perfect storybook ending because the way it ended... It ended quite well. What? It led for a spinoff that you could follow the girls' team. You could follow the women's team. It ended the men's saga perfectly. Ted's back in Kansas. The men are finally... His relationship premier- up in the air, though. Nothing Nothing was... Uh, his relationship with his son. That's all that matters, and that's resolved. Okay. So it's it ended. It ended well. There's only like a couple ways that it can work, really. We come back two years later 
the son has died in a horrific car accident. <laughs> <laughs> and Ted Lasso is a broken man. That would be awful. It would be. That's not what I was thinking of. So you tell me, because like I said, I can think of a lot of ways it doesn't nail the landing yep. or sick the landing. And then you're like, did we really need to come back at that point? The thing I'm thinking of that has me scared is there's this thing that sitcoms and a lot of shows like to do to shake things up. And I am, I am so afraid that they'll do this. And basically it is you like reverse something. And since this was always a fish out of water story with Ted and beard, my fear would be, Oh, now the Brits have to come help Ted do something in America. And the Brits are the fish out of water. I think that's lame and they shouldn't do that. I think Ted should go back to England, but I don't know how, cause you're right. They seem to have wrote themselves into a corner that takes away from the ending because that's the whole reason he went back to Kansas Mm -hmm. was for the sun. And honestly, I thought it led perfectly for if you go the cheers route, Frazier is technically a spinoff. It led for a Frazier esque spinoff where Ted's existing somewhere in the world. You just don't occasion you don't see him except for. Once in a blue moon. And it's rarity if you do get to see him. And it still centers around the team, but you've got Roy Kent and Nate yes. as the coaches. And you have new team members. like Yes, a whole new cast is in and a couple familiar strong faces that you just launch from. See, I think that was, that's what everyone was hoping for when, it, when Sudeikis was, yeah, that's it. We're done. I think that's what everyone was hoping for because there were some rumblings, especially from, uh, and forgive me, I can't remember his name right now, but the guy who plays Nate, his social media account, seemed to be that there was some things being talked about behind the scenes as far as maybe a spinoff. But now that Sudeikis is back, allegedly, presumably, I just don't know. I don't know where you go with the story now. You have to find a way to bring him back. And I, I don't know, because the show is called Ted Lasso. Unless, see, this is why I keep coming back to my fear. Because it seems like he's got to be in Kansas now. Which, there's a part of that that's really appealing to us. Because we live in Kansas. So there's hilarious things they could do with that. Because Sudeikis knows. He knows us. That's what made him half, that's what was made half the show for us anyways. Is because a lot of his mannerisms... His kind of down, oh, aw shucks, down home sayings he says are very Kansas. Like, th- there are literally Ted Lasso's all over Kansas like that. You could bring it to Kansas and bring soccer to Kansas. He could coach an MLS team. He could. And you could bring con- Roy and. You could contrive a way where Rebecca. It gets ownership of an MLS team somehow. Yep. Yeah. She has money. And and maybe her husband, who's a pilot. So the, the he's the key. Because presumably she ends up with the Amsterdam pilot. And if he's a pilot, he can literally be moved anywhere. He could be. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. I'm just glad it's coming back. I trust the writers of that show because they did such a good job. I think it's one of the most well-written shows well, that I can think of, they are the well, one of the forerunners, showrunners for the show was the guy behind Scrubs. So, there you go. And you're a big Scrubs guy. I am. I was not a big Scrubs person, but I trust your judgment on that. So, we're back, baby. Yeah, Ted Lasso, season four. Um, the next article, the next news I want to talk about. It's about a guy named Bradley Whitford. Are you aware who Bradley Whitford is? Oh, B. Radley? <laughs> B. Radley? Is that, is that a nickname? I don't think I know B. Radley, but I might know B. B. Radley. I think most people recently remember him from the movie Get Out. Oh. Um, but people oh, are... Oh, yes, I know Bradley. Yeah, people, Or B. Rad, as yeah. I call him. People our age probably remember him from the West Wing and Billy Madison. I was going to say Billy Madison is where I remember him. For me, he's just always the bad guy from Billy Madison. 
that's how I remember him. I was aware he was on the West Wing, but I wasn't a big fan of the West Wing. Well, you know, in our day and age, people are so political. And I don't usually talk about politics, but this story was so absurd that I thought I had to bring it up because this is absurd. Is it though? Contrarian Cody might come out. Well, he, Contrarian Cody can come out, but I, well, let me let me tell them the story. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who up until a couple weeks ago or a week ago was running for president as an independent. He was an independent. He tried to make it into the two-party system. They said, no, you're too school for cool. And so he's like, I'm going third party. Okay. I mean, he had no shot. He never had a shot. But he has a name. People are aware of him. He's been around for a while. Well, he's married to Cheryl Hines. And if you that name sounds familiar, she was in Curb Your Enthusiasm for years. That's the best thing people would remember her from. I was going to say, she's had... Parts in a lot of the shows. So she is married to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. They've been married uh, for a while. They've been together for a long time. Husband and wife. And RFK Jr. dropped out of the race and endorsed Trump, which was kind of big news. I'm not here to tell you why. I'm like, literally, let me preface all this by saying I do not care. Yes, Dave really does not. I do not care about politics. And so that's not where I'm going with this story. But he kind of surprised people because he endorsed Trump and he's been a Democrat his whole life. Um, his whole family. Yeah, he's a Kennedy. They've mm. kind of been the symbol of the Democratic Party for a while. What the Bushes are to the Republicans, the Kennedys are to the Dems. Well, Bradley Whitford. He decided Red. he decided he was going to out somebody, and it wasn't RFK. He decides he's going to go after his wife, Cheryl Hines, because I'm presuming they've worked together on something. They must yes. know each other. Mm -hmm. He said this on X, quote, hey, Cheryl Hines, way to stay silent while your lunatic husband throws his support behind the educated rapist who brags about stripping women of their fundamental rights. Gutsy. Great example for the kids. Profile in courage. End quote. Okay. So, like, look, first of all, as for social media, as far as social media goes, this is pretty tame. Very tame. Like, social media, especially X, you got people saying all kinds of crazy stuff. Here's what I don't get about it. I, granted, you're taking a shot at someone. It's clear he doesn't like them. Right. I mean, this guy doesn't like them. Now, number one, what we, we tell people all the time as pastors, don't let politics get in the way of your relationships. There was a time, believe it or not, when people could disagree on politics and still be friends. That seems less and less likely these days, um, but it shouldn't be. We shouldn't let this get in the way of relationship. But he calls out Cheryl Hines. And basically says, well, she should have said something to which I get really confused, Cody, because she's RFK Jr.'s wife. What is she supposed to do? So through good times and in bad, Cody. Yeah, I think that she could have easily from his perspective, Bradley's perspective, uh, said, although I love my husband dearly until death do us part. We are going to agree to disagree on this. I think that's what he expected. Because the thing is, both Cheryl and RFK Jr. have been very outspoken on their political leanings and beliefs. And up until, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago, RFK Jr. didn't have a ton of positive things to say about Mr. Trump. I think that Bradley feels that if you're going to be outspoken when like everyone's on your team, when things get down and out, you should still be that strong minded and that strong willed and at least say, eh, we're going to disagree on this one. I'm not casting my lot with this individual. Okay. What, whatever your politics may be. Honest question though. How many wives do you know that were they in a somewhat similar situation would do that? 
Um, because whether whether I, it's whether so it's so I'm married to a woman that would. Yeah, you are. Yes, but I think we can all agree that that Leah is an exceptional human being. Yes, and she is strong willed and fiery. She's feisty, and and we know if Leah were to disagree with you publicly, th- those of us that know you, it wouldn't have anything to do with where she feels like you and her place in your relationship. She mm. wouldn't be trying to, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? She wouldn't be trying to subvert your any authority you may yes. or may not have. But a lot of people don't live like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people want their a lot of husbands want their wives to back their plays but i think a lot of wives want their husbands to back their plays it's yes. weird to me i guess what i'm saying is it would it's it would be odd to me to have a, a happily married couple publicly not back each other's one of their plays and it would be even weirder to call it out to to say why don't you do that because that's that just seems strange. So we have seen this before, but not so much in the realm of politics. But go back to the uh, SAT scandal, not Lori Loughlin, not the Lori other Loughlin. one, uh, uh, William H Macy. See, yes, did he? I don't. I missed that. Did I feel like he out? spoke out against his wife in that whole going on. Wow! Wow! Okay. All right, listen, I'm not saying it's not out of the realm of possibility, and I'm not saying it can't be done while maintaining your respect towards your spouse. Clearly, I think it can be done, but it does depend on how healthy your relationship is, I would say, how healthy your marriage is. I just found it to be strange to have another actor call it out. Why didn't you? Because I guess to me it just wouldn't be something that I thought was plausible or likely to happen like why was he expecting her to or is he just trying to make a political statement i think that he's just trying to make a political statement which brings me back to why i hate politics because half the things people say on social media they're just trying to highlight highlight how right they are very few people will want to really engage in a conversation about real topics about things we feel strongly about and how to really drive towards something better for everyone. It's more about our righteousness most of the time on social media. And that's why I think I just got soured on politics. I'm like, I don't even want to talk about it because people aren't going to have an honest discussion. Well, it's used to be a great divider, not so much a unifier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because even if you say, oh, we vote the same party line. You get into the issues and it's like, well, you really aren't one of us. How dare you? Yeah. I'm a peacemaker at heart, Cody. Yep. Blessed are the peacemakers. And here's, here's the thing. If you're listening to this and you got heated just listening to that and you got mad because I didn't care, <laughs> maybe you did. I don't know. Here's what I, I need you to know. I don't care who you're voting for. I don't care what kind of life you're living. You're welcome at my table. And I mean that. That's real. That's truth. Anybody listening, you would be welcome at my dinner table. Because I believe that's that's what we're missing is this this ability to be like, hey, we don't have to we don't have to do this thing where we all have to ag- agree on the way we're living mm-hmm. to to try and be caring towards each other. Please let me know that you are coming because <laughs> we don't always prepare enough food. Make an appointment though. <laughs> <laughs> let us know. <laughs> You're gonna be people are gonna show up to my house. We're like, oh uh, well, we're having macaroni and cheese tonight, and you're gonna have to fight my son for it because he loves the craft. He does. All right, we are going to take a break. When we come back, it's time for us to head out into the lobby. It's been ages. It has been. We're gonna answer listener questions out in the lobby when we come back. Welcome to the lobby. All right, Cody, we are out in the lobby. We're in the concession area. There was some cobwebs around the Reese's Pieces. The lobby had been vacant for a while. (laughs) Yeah, we haven't been out to the lobby in a little bit, but we're out here now. 
and we are going to answer your questions, listeners. That's right. Mm-hmm. Are you excited for this, Cody? I am. I, I literally love answering listeners' questions. The first question comes from Jim Smith from Pittman, New Jersey. Hi, James. Jimothy. Jim- <laughs> we'll just go with Jim. Jim, we'll, we'll have to go. I'd like to go to New Jersey someday. Um, visit, visit our friend Jim. We're going to the Garden State. I wish we could go to New York Comic Con. If we ever go to New York Comic Con, Jim, we'll come visit you too. Yes. Uh, but he has a question for us. He sa- he asks, you have to pick a president. We're, we're going all politics all the time here. That's what we're about. I know, right? <laughs> Obviously. You have to pick a president, living or dead, to be our next president. Who do you pick? Okay, so I'm going to assume that Harrison Ford's off the table. <laughs> Yeah, be, I think he wants a real president. <laughs> Although, you got to go dead, right? There's uh, no one living you want, right? <laughs> like, I kind of want to see what Carter was like. Just because he seemed like a super nice old guy. Yeah, when I was nice. born in a young child into the teens and adult years. Yeah, but he's dead now too, right? No. Is he still alive? I thought he died. Yeah. No, he's still with us. Months. Oh, he's not doing well, though, right? Uh, he's been on hospice for like over a year. Oh, my goodness. Gracious. That dude just holding on. He is. Good, um, good for him. So I will go with Teddy. Teddy? Roosevelt, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt. Just so I can say bully for you. <laughs> and also, he seemed like quite a character. You are aware the real Teddy Roosevelt wasn't played by Robin Williams. <laughs> I'm just making sure you know this. I like to think he's a lot like Robin Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I got to come up with a different pick because that was going to be my pick, <laughs> and now I can't. I can't have the same pick as you. I was going to go with Teddy just because it seems like we could use a Teddy Roosevelt right now. Well, I mean, I can go with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, Abe. Abe seems too easy though. It does, but then you can quote Wayne's World, and then that's always fun. Yeah. I don't know if I was going to pick a living president, it says something about where we're at when I'm like, well, gee, either George W or Barack seem okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think that tells you just where we're at when I'm just like, either of them seem fine. <laughs> Can we bring back 2003 prices if we bring back G dubs? Cause I would vote for him a second if we could do that. Yes. Everything's so expensive, Cody. I just don't like that. But a dead president. I'll tell you who I'm not picking. We're not going with Andrew Jackson. Okay. Andy was towards the top of the not pick. Oh, list. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Andrew Jackson, I don't think he was a nice dude. Old hickory. And, and a lot of things he does is like, he's like the first president that does the, my rich friends are going to benefit from this presidency type gig. He was like one of the first people to do that. Who's the guy that got pneumonia at his inauguration? Do you remember him? Yes. was It wasn't Taft. Taft was the one that got stuck in the bathtub. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Harrison. It was William Henry Harrison. Yep. You know what? I'm going to go with William Henry Harrison. <laughs> I feel bad for him. Get I think him he deserves a, a shot. Coat. And, yeah, get him a coat. Get the stuff. Out of his lungs, and let's bring William Henry Harrison back. I'll take him. Just because I think he really, he if he got his chance, he'd really want to do a good job and, and make us proud. I also kind of am intrigued by Grant. If Grant didn't have to take over after a civil war. Yeah, the thing about U.S. Grant is, and I don't know how much you know about him, but he was apparently brilliant. Like a brilliant dude. But West Point had a lot of brokenness. Was Don't we all addicted to alcohol? Yeah, I mean, had a had a rough time of it, but by all accounts, was a brilliant, brilliant dude. Yeah, that was a good question. Outside our our norm. Yeah. Next question comes from Will Montgomery from California. Oh, we're going across the nation. We reach from coast to coast and all over the world, baby. <laughs> Did I tell you we're in the top hundred listen podcasts in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Yes. <laughs> Winning. <laughs> uh, we've got missionary friends and I'm not really sure how it happens. Cause I know, I, I know uh, 
a guy we know named Adam who listens. He's a missionary in South Africa, but I know he travels around. So I'm assuming he just listened near the Democratic Republic of Congo a couple times and we got credit for it. That might go up on the board. Are we going to be like the Hoff, like Hasselhoff? <laughs> We're just going to be huge in the, in the Congo? I hope so. I hope so, too, because I will never not make the joke of the, there I was, there I was, there I was, in the Congo. <laughs> I love that commercial. That's an old commercial. All right. Will asks, what is the worst movie you've ever seen but is actually a favorite? Batman versus Superman and Thor 4 don't count, Cody. LOL. Let's clarify, because I was confused by this. Do you think he means, like, we objectively recognize that it's not a good movie, but we like it anyways. Is that what he means? You think is that how you read that? I think that it's universally panned, but we still like it, but secretly we are huge fans. Okay. I, okay. I have a whole series that a ton of people hate, but it's so campy. It's so good. Uh, the whole Sharknado series peaking at, I think Sharknado three, Maybe four. Five was awful. It clearly had a, a fan base. Uh, like they made so many of them. I think the sci fi channel was like, this is the only thing we got, <laughs> baby. This had more than eight people watching it. We've got to make another one. <laughs> Hot stuff. Other- Get Iron Zeering on the phone. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, a movie I like that a lot of people hate, and it was John Candy's. Last movie and didn't get finished. Wagons East. Really? Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's it. It's hilarious. I remember liking it. But I was all also I saw it after he died. So I saw I was, it much after he died. It just kind of made me sad to watch because I knew we weren't getting any more John Candy. But that's a good pick. I think the the one movie I think of the most when I think of objectively, I know it's terrible when I'm watching it but I just love it anyway, is basketball <laughs> with the guys who created South, South Park. Park. Yeah, it's it's so dumb. It's so dumb, but there's something about those dudes and the way they deliver lines that is just hilarious. I just can't, I can't get enough of them. I think Trey Parker and Matt Stone are actually brilliant geniuses. I wish they wouldn't be quite so vulgar, but I think they're brilliant, and uh, I, I love that movie. Um, honestly... It is the super brilliant ones that tend to have the most impact in comedy, pop culture wise, I feel. Mm -hmm. Like all the Monty Python guys are like Oxford gents. Conan O'Brien's from like Harvard. I mean, you have these figures that put their fingerprints on the map of comedy. And Matt and Trey, they examine things from unique perspectives that you even as a fan for how many ever years you're still not expecting that you're like oh this is so them i think it helped that a lot of comedy is always referencing pop culture yes and of course south park does that in spades Uh, but they're around they're near my age so the things and especially in basketball So if you've never seen baseball, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's about a made-up sport that they made up in their driveway. And it's like a combination of baseball and basketball. And you basically shoot from different areas to get like a single, a double, a triple home run or whatever. (laughs) But then the other team that's on defense can do whatever they want to try to, quote, psych you out. And the first thing, like the first time one of them tries to psych the other one out when they're just playing in their driveway he's lining up for like a free throw or something like trying to focus and concentrate. And and he's over there going, Steve Perry, Steve Perry. And I should have been gone. (laughs) And I just, that gets me every stinking time. And I think I quote that movie quite a bit. Occasionally I've heard a few. Yeah. So that's mine. Uh, Lauren Allen from Texas. Oh, she says, what movie are you most excited to see in theaters between now and the end of the year? It might be Terrifier 3, honestly, that Mm. I'm most looking forward to. It's in my top three of movies that are left to come out in 2024. No, people dig Terrifier. I'd never heard of it until you started talking about it on the pod. Now I see it everywhere. It is everywhere. 
but if I'm not going Terrifier 3, I'm I'm going Joker with Gaga. I love the first one. I mean, it, it's okay. I just, I, I yearn for things to be more connected. And I know that's not what he was trying to do. Yeah. And yeah. so, and I really wasn't interested in like, the Joker's weird because I feel like Nolan's Joker had just the right amount of grittiness with still a, a lot of comic book sentimentality. Whereas the Joaquin Phoenix one, I mean, you, you get the, the sentimentality's gone. It's gritty. Yeah, it's an Elseworld Joker. Right, and I'm, and I'm okay with that. So I I actually really like some of the Elseworld stories a lot, but like you can't get them to be connected into a cinematic universe. No. So you yeah. need these like one-offs or this is set aside somewhere else. Don't think of it connected with anything. I guess I should amend what I'm saying. I'm not mad they made it. It's just not for me. Yes. I get that. Yeah. So the movies I'm looking forward to the year. First of all, is this not a great year for movies? Has this been a down year? Well, I'd have to look and see. Did Dune 2 come out this year? Yeah, I think so. So I don't think it's been a down year. I just think that it's been weirdly spaced out. Because usually you have like this big run. And it's like. Uh, we don't want to step on anyone's toes, so we're going to space these all out. So I was looking at the list of movies still yet to come out, and I was hard-pressed to find which ones I thought we would do reviews on, because I don't think there's super obvious ones. Uh, but I guess if I had to pick a movie that I'm most looking forward to, there's there's a 1A a and a 1B for me. Okay. 1A is Wicked. I really enjoyed Wicked when it came out as a book. Uh, the full name of which I forget now because it had a long name uh, that got shortened to Wicked when it came out as a Broadway play. I loved the book, and when they turned it into a Broadway play, I thought I would hate it. But I took my wife on our, I believe it was our second anniversary. It was either our first or second anniversary. We went to Chicago, and I saw the Broadway version of the play traveling. Uh, it wasn't the original cast. It was the second cast. Uh, but still, they were amazing. It was dynamite. And I fell in love with it. I thought it was great. I just thought it was incredible. And then when they announced much later that they were going to come out with this movie, I thought, oh, man, the musicals aren't doing well. Do we really need this? And then when I heard Ariana Grande was playing Glinda, I thought, ooh, nobody can live live up to Kristen Chenoweth. Uh, Ari can sing. But then I saw the trailer. And, I, and darned if I didn't think. And she kind of nails it, like more than the girl playing Elphaba. But I don't think she gets a lot to do in the trailer. They they show a lot of uh, Ariana Grande's character gets better moments in the trailer, I think. Mm-hmm. And the music, I'm just a fan of the music. I just like Wicked. I think it's great. I'm looking forward to it. And I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be entertaining. One B for me, and I can't believe I'm about to say this. Is Gladiator 2. Oh, you didn't go with the sequel I thought you were going to go with. No, I'm going with Gladiator 2, again, based solely on the trailer. Because in my head, I think this is a ridiculous idea. This is a movie that you didn't need to make, Ridley Scott. There was no reason to make this movie. But I saw the trailer and I thought, man, that's a good trailer. It has a great cast. Yeah, Denzel. it It really hits on some of my rules. Like, I will just see anything with Denzel in it. Just period. End of statement. And so when once I saw Denzel was in it, I was in. But not only was I in, I'm kind of excited about it. So I take it Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice was not your cup of tea. Well, yeah, there's the Tim Burton effect. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mind Beetlejuice. Of all Tim Burton movies, it's probably my second favorite after Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, because Michael Keaton, though. Yes. I could have done without the Tim Burtonist, but that's one of those movies where it fits well. It does fit well. And growing up, I watched that movie like a hundred times in the cartoon series. Loved it. Oh, I forgot there was a cartoon series. No, the cartoon series was great. <laughs> Finally, Kyle Kessinger uh, uh, says, is it time to box up Star Wars as a franchise and put it in the attic? Maybe let a generation go by, then dust it off. There's so much <laughs> Star Wars out there. A new set of movies, cartoons, streaming shows, Lego Star Wars, on and on and on. Is it too much? Growing up, we had episodes four, five, and six, and that was it. 
has it gotten so big that its quality is declining? Okay. If you were going to box it up, you had to box it up in 1983, never touch it again. So I'm going to reference my dear fr- friend, Quentin Tarantino. He did an interview this week. Oh, I know what interview you're talking about. And he said, Toy Story 1 through 3 is a great trilogy. And he refuses to watch 4. He not in like he, he didn't, wasn't saying it negatively. He just yeah. said, no, I just never watched it. Yeah, I'm not going to watch it because... One through three is great. And he he specifically said three is a perfect movie. It and is. And it's a perfect ending. Oh. And so he just didn't watch four. It doesn't exist to him. Well, that's how I was with Indiana Jones. That's how you should have been with Rocky Five. But once you watch it, it's real. It's there. You can't yeah. undo it. Yeah. And so at this point, no, you can't stop. The issue with Star Wars is... They did too much fan service. They listened too much to the fans. You got to tell the fans yes. what they need, not listen to the fans and be like, oh, well, we got to rewrite this. So that way you all feel like Luke's character wasn't wasted or you got to do yeah. this. Yeah. And like Boba Fett, I thought when you see him in The Mandalorian, it's like, okay, that's good. But then you get the book of Boba Fett and it's like, Oh, we really didn't need all the Boba Fett like we had yeah. talked about in the 90s and the aughts. Like, oh, Boba Fett needs to come back and we need a whole venture about Boba Fett. Well, you know why it doesn't work? Because Do Boba Fett's old? No, well, I, I don't know. I mean, that's Tamira Morrison slander and I'm not going to engage in that. But <laughs> <laughs> the reason Boba Fett doesn't work is because Boba Fett was only a cool character because we didn't get much of him. We didn't know who he was. He was mysterious. Yes. He looked cool. He did. And he dies like almost immediately in Return of the Jedi, mm-hmm. which I think some fans even back then were annoyed by that because they had there was like this weird cult of Boba Fett fans. But when you decide we're going to yeah make an entire show, when you base a story around him, all of a sudden you got to humanize him. That's what makes mm-hmm. characters interesting. My contention about the Book of Boba Fett is once you decided to make a show, it was going to be disappointing. It just didn't matter what you did because he was mysterious. That's why people liked his character. And his appearance in Mandalorian was great. Yes. Because you're still not getting any more humanizing story. And there's still a mystique and an aura around him. You don't quite get it flushed out. So like you can launch into all these different fan theories that that's star Wars issue is they, they try to give the fans what they think they need instead of telling the fans, this is what you need. Um, If DJ was here, he would say uh, wrestling. They talk about this all the time. You tell the fans what they want. You don't go and give in to every whim that the fans have. Now, you got to be aware of what the fans are asking for. And you got to be aware of where the parameters are because you can go way outside and miss the mark and no one's going to be watching it. But if you keep to some good creative stories, the fans will follow. I tend to agree with you. Uh, if you were going to stop it, just never make more after four, five, and six. Yeah, you had to stop. Uh, and back and in then, the 80s. even then, I'm willing to accept the prequels. It took me a while. I was disappointed when they came out, even though I saw them all multiple times in the theater because I wanted to like them. I really wanted to like them. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've gotten softer in my judgment of them. It was an acquired taste. Well, I mean, it's they still have a like, especially two. Attack of the Clones is just objectively not a great movie at all. <laughs> it's really bad. Three kind of saves it a little bit, and uh, one is really saved by the lightsaber battles. Epic. And Qui-Gon. honestly, honestly, a weird reflection that Jake Lloyd did not get a fair shake. Yes. I don't understand. When I rewatched that for the our Be Kind Rewind, I just did not understand the Jake Lloyd hate at all. I've seen I've seen kid actors. I mean, look, look, I watched the first five episodes of The Acolyte. And the kid actors for that show were really, I thought, struggling, but not in a way that I don't think they could probably do it. It's just that they just seem so wooden. And I just think with kid actors, you got to have a director who just knows how to handle kids. 
if you look back through cinema history, there's very few right. that really you're like, wow, this kid was a natural. Yeah. For me, Kyle, I just pick what and choose what I want to watch. I watched, I, I gave Acolyte a fair shake. I think more than fair shake, actually, because the first two episodes, I was so stinking bored and I actually watched the first five. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to watch anymore. I'll just watch YouTube recaps to see where the story goes. I told my friend Kiefer I would binge watch it. I still haven't done it yet. <laughs> but I, Kiefer, I will do it. <laughs> I really enjoyed Ahsoka, even though that was not a perfect show. That had some story writing issues. I enjoyed Obi-Wan, even though I, I just didn't care about the other storylines. I just cared about Obi-Wan and Anakin and Vader. Yeah. Uh, but I, I enjoyed watching that play out, even if I didn't think it was a perfect show either. But I don't know. Yeah. I think Star Wars for me was four, five, and six. And that's what it'll always be. And everything after that is just, I'll pick and choose. Love episode eight and Rogue One. But I guess I need to finish that thought. It's not for us anymore. It's good that we can still enjoy it. But like, like you know, people are signing petitions because they want to see more of the Acolyte. And if they want it, if, if there's enough people that Disney thinks they should make one, then make it. That's fine with me. Oh, yeah. I, it, if people enjoy it, make it. If they can make money, they'll do it. <laughs> all right. That is all we got for the lobby. We're going to come back and talk about a serious subject, I suppose. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence. When we come back. All right, Cody, we're back. We're going to talk about, I guess, something serious. It, it's more serious. It will lend itself to being a more serious conversation just because of the obvious questions it brings up for how this changes an industry or maybe creativity in general. Creativity, ethics. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of categories oh, here. Yeah. And I'll try to hit most of the main ones. And, and get your thoughts for sure. Because at the end of the day, I don't know that I have a lot of thoughts other than I'm interested and fascinated by it all to see where it goes. And I'm more fascinated by the big picture too. Yes. There's a lot of real obvious categories and we'll talk about all of them. Uh, but I'm mostly fascinated by what does this do to creativity and art? Like people think of AI and they think, oh, those videos where there's like eight fingers on the hand and <laughs> like there's a rocket for a leg and then it turns into a swan. And <sighs> Looking at you, Facebook. <laughs> yes. If I see one more, how come we don't share more pictures like this, America? I'm like, well, because it's obviously not real. It is too real to me. <laughs> We're in an interesting spot with AI right now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, full disclosure, I do use AI, ChatGBT, as a tool, uh, mostly on the radio side of things. Radio, the way we do it here at the station, I'm the only one working here. We have a lot of volunteers. And most radio shows that are daily, you would have a team of people working on things, writing things. It's not just all on one person. And so to keep up with content, I just use AI as a tool. But here's the, what I tell people, because someone was asking me about this the other day. I was like, well, listen, you're going to do almost just as much work if you're using AI right than you would have anyways. It's just help. It helps guide you if you're using it right. You got to prompt it well. You got to know how to prompt it. You mm -hmm. got to be very detailed. Give it exactly what you want. And then you're going to ex expect to like redirect it a few times. Like, eh, I don't like this part. Kind of lean into this heavier. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like really, you're going to have to fine tune it. The second part is, if you're doing it as a dodge to get out of work, like if you're trying to get AI to do all the work, to write you a paper, if you're in school or whatever, then that's not going to work. That's going to come back terrible. If you're using it to help as a helper and you're still putting in the work, you'll be fine and find it a nice tool. Yes. Uh, so from that end of it, I think AI can be a good tool, but I think people can get in trouble when they're trying to get it to do their job for them. And uh, I have a story. Okay. Did you hear about the Megalopolis marketing campaign 
The uh, trailer dropped for Megalopolis, which is a Francis Ford Coppola movie. It is a Francis movie. Well, the, a big dust up happened. In the trailer, there's all these quotes that are featured in the trailer. And there are all these quotes that kind of like, well, okay. So for, for instance, the Godfather, Pauline Kale, allegedly of the New Yorker, quote, diminished by its artsiness. It was all these like really scathing one word reviews of Coppola movies, but they're all like his best movies. Godfather, Apocalypse Now. You might be able to dig up a critic or two that were like, this wasn't my cup of tea, but universally it was almost adored. Right. And they were scathing so much so that when I first saw the trailer, I thought, oh, this isn't real. This is sarcasm. They're using sarcasm here. And I thought, well, that's snarky. I wouldn't have expected that for this kind of a movie. I wouldn't have expected it for my dear friend Francis. Because that was all that made sense to me. I was like, oh, they're being snarky. But that wasn't the case at all. As it turns out, a couple days later, Lionsgate fired their marketing consultant named Eddie Egan because he apparently used AI to create the quotes that end up in that trailer. Now, you sent me this story, Cody. I did. And I immediately I responded, how does this happen? How? How how do you have something with all of this money writing on it? I don't I have no I can't even fathom a guess of how much this movie costs to make and how much this marketing consultant was getting paid to come up with a you know trailer stuff. The idea that you would turn that over to AI knowing this is an untested thing. Or b- apparently he didn't know. It is not the creative marketing that it should have been. So Variety prompted ChatGPT on their own to provide negative cri- criticism about Coppola's work. And it the responses provided were strikingly similar to the quotes ones included in the trailer. So they, they probably typed in a, it probably took them 30 seconds to type out a prompt. So this dude making all this money spent no time typed in some simple prompt and it came back with lies because like, look, here's the thing. Think about how unreliable the internet is at large, just all the information on it. Just think about the totality of it and how unreliable that is. And well, understand that that's what AI is scouring. Well, Abraham Lincoln said, you can't always believe what you read on the internet. <laughs> and he's, he was so right, Cody. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I just couldn't believe this story. And it led us down this rabbit hole of thinking about AI and its impact just total on pop culture. How is this going to work? Because we have questions. So... I wanted to break it down into categories of here's going to be the challenges and here's going to be the opportunities. Because I think just like with anything, there's nuance here. There is. Like I said before, if you know how to use AI and you use it correctly, it could be a really good tool. Do you want to go through the challenges of it first or should we go through the good things? The challenges. Okay. Challenge number one of AI in pop culture authenticity and originality. So AI generated art is going to struggle to capture the depth of human experience and emotional nuance. If you ask AI to tell you a story and you can even feed it like the features of the story you want, it's going to lack a human component because it can't feel Mm -hmm. humans can feel and we can transfer that feeling into stories. This is why we cry at movies even commercials. Yeah. <laughs> you're like my mom. You cry at the McDonald's commercial where the kid gets bullied figure skating on the ice, the frozen pond, and yes. Ronald, Ronald helps her helps him up. And my mom cries because she's just sensitive to that kind of stuff. But there's a concern that as AI tools become more prevalent, that we're going to see kind of a watering down of artistic expression. Do you think that's a fair concern? I think to a degree... I think probably the more advanced AI gets and the more it's being used, the more it's going to get closer and closer to being something that even the best of critics will 
struggle with saying, is this human or is this AI? Because this seems to be capturing some emotions. See, that's kind of scary to me. I watched a movie this year that I loved, loved this movie. And it used AI and it got criticized because the art that it generated, and it was just brief images. It wasn't something significant. The movie was Late Night with the Devil, which is a 70s talk show. And so the graphics that popped up right before commercial breaks or coming back from commercial breaks, they used AI. But Hmm. you could tell, like, because it takes place around Halloween, like the skeleton, the hands weren't quite right. There's an owl that's the the mascot for the show, and it looks a little weird. So they got criticism for this? They got criticized because people were able to spot it. You could have just hired some artists to do a mock-up and make it look legit 70s late-night talk show. My pushback on that would be, I hear you, but I'm guessing the budget wasn't high on that movie. So, Like, it wasn't a Marvel movie. A24 is a bigger, small production company. Yeah, that's true. And so, like, they have always gotten, like, Oscar buzz. You hear great things about a lot of their movies, but they don't have massive budgets. And so, I do agree, like... The pro is you save some money, but if it doesn't look quite right, doesn't feel human, doesn't feel 70s talk show, you're going to take some people out of it. Yeah. Now, me not growing up in the 70s, but having seen clips from 70s talk shows, I didn't think twice about it. It, I think it depends on the piece of art you're talking about, too. I can almost understand what they were thinking using that for that sort of thing, like well, hey, we're not experts in 70s talk shows, so let's just pump this into AI and see what it gives us, and if we think that looks right, we'll go with it. Maybe you just didn't have anyone of that expertise, but then, yeah, you got to hire a professional. That's going to cost you more money. I can almost understand that. I think especially when you're talking about music, we've already heard AI-created songs and music, and ah, some of it sounds okay, Yeah, but some of it can sound like really generic. I guess I think the critic, the critique of pop music music over the years has been that it can end up sounding generic after a while. Oh yeah. And so if humans are going to sound generic, how much more generic will something without a soul feed you? You know? Well, I, I honestly think that it could fit right in within contemporary pop music. That cynical Cody has arrived. Yes. <laughs> Especially the the songs that are meant to be more like club songs. Yeah, there, for there's, sure. The electronic music. Yeah, there's not a lot of substance. There's not a lot of depth. And you're repeating the same phrases over and over and you just have cool beats. I don't doubt that AI computer generated artists and or track would compete with that well this kind of goes into our next challenge from ai and that would be creative jobs so as ai takes on more roles in the creative process there's a risk of job displacement for artists musicians producers that's what i thought of just now because like think about rap music so you have these people that have always been a part of rap music who are just the people that create the music behind the rap Mm -hmm. the producers the ones who laid on beat. i mean dr dre is one of the most single most accomplished people in the music industry, basically from pr- producing. Dre, Pharrell, Daft Punk. If we enter a place where, like, as you said, there's not a lot of depth in some of the beats, things like that, making a catchy beat seems like something that maybe AI could master, it could do. Well, what's going to stop a rapper from saying, well, instead of paying a producer all this money, why can't I just use AI to lay me down a beat and keep keep prompting it until I get one I like? And using that, like, you could even do it where you lay out the time, you know, the timing of the song, the music beat. Like, yeah. I want a, you know, four, three, I don't even know. I'm not a music guy, but you know what I mean? Like, the the measure length. Yeah. And so, you, like, you could even specify, based on what your rap is, the right kind of feel and beats and oh man i just gotta think that producers gotta be worried 
about this, but jobs in general, in the especially in the production world. This is something that I think a lot of blue collar mainstream America has had issues or concerns with with technology probably for the past 25 years is that oh the machines or the technology is going to replace our jobs whether it's at the factory or it's being a mechanic or whatever that technology is slowly getting rid of us and it's cheaper and more efficient mm-hmm. to to have these machines now it has cycled into the world of pop culture media and where we had lifted up this group of people as artisans and had labeled them a very specific skill set that is not common for the layperson. Well, now it's common for the machine. I would be really concerned if I was not one of the upper dogs. If you are someone that has a track record and you kind of have your finger on the pulse of the industry, I think that you're going to be golden. It's up-and-coming people that, like, I want to go into being an engineer or a producer, but now this is on the horizon. It might not be here yet, but 10 years down the road, it, it could very possibly be the only thing that's there. There are experts out there who are predicting that AI within 10 to 15 years could replace two thirds of our w- entire workforce right now, mm-hmm. which is just a, I mean, I mean, that's an obscene number to think about like, oh, oh, well that could cause some sort of crisis. I would think a, a huge one. Yeah. So the jobs part of it, I think is definitely a concern, especially in the technical side of creation. I think for sure. Um, Let's move on to the last challenge. I think would be ethical concerns. So issues around copyright, ownership, the ethical use of AI and art. Those are significant concerns. Uh, For example, how should we credit or compensate AI in the creation of art? A lot of artists will tell you that if it's scouring the internet for its data, then it's technically stealing other people's art that's copyrighted. But like it's impossible to monitor. Part of me sees this as the least problematic of all of the challenges. And this is probably the cynical part of me. I feel like the things making the money from pop culture stuff are the big corporations anyways. That I feel like most artists, if they're not like, you know, Steven Spielberg, if they're just your huge middle group of people who are just trying to survive in the business, they're not the ones making the money anyways. It's the corporations. So part of me thinks... Well, if it's going to take down those corporations who have a, you know, a, a lock on the on the industry, part of me thinks, well, good if it affects the corporate structure a little bit. Comrade Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. What do you think about the ethical stuff? This might be the thing that slows down or hinders us from launching fully into all AI all the time. You have enough people with enough power, financial backing. Like if Taylor Swift says this is an issue because they clearly just sampled one of my lyrics or Quincy Jones says this is an issue because I know this This is from this song that I did with Michael Jackson back in the day. Whatever it may be, you get enough of those people, that will put a hold on at least it being used heavily in the media realm. I think the ethics is the place that you're going to get the most traction if you're wanting to slow down AI from... Doing away with a lot of creative jobs, a lot of creativity. We're in some interesting times because a lot of what we have, even today, we borrow so much from people that are long since dead. Like if you're in literature, Shakespeare gets borrowed quite a bit. There's people that take historical artwork and then transform it into a modern setting like the Mona Lisa. Um, and I don't know if Da Vinci would have wanted that. 
And so we're already in some ethical weird places. And it's like, does it really matter? Maybe not. But should it matter? I don't know. I'm not so sure because in, in maybe this is a completion to my corporate thought. My problem isn't that I want the artists to benefit from their creation more mm-hmm. than the corporations. My problem is, is that by definition does creation just open it up for free use. Isn't that the point of creating that? Like, because we live at, live in a capitalist society it becomes people's careers and jobs and their livelihoods and all that. And then for, in some cases, the path to superstardom and super wealth uh, for like these corporate structures. But if I'm just looking at root of what creation is, isn't it just meant for public consumption? This was the kind of thing I always thought about when Metallica was making a big deal oh, and suing with people with Napster. Mm-hmm. It's like, one, you're already rich. Two, this is how you got popular. You were literally, Metallica was literally handing out free recordings of underground concerts. That's how they got big, was passing around free bootlegged cassettes of their music. And then, like, there's this this idea of, like, you created something, then you let it loose into the world, and maybe you shouldn't be able to control that. So there's only one artist I have seen that has really controlled it well. Banksy. Banksy. Oh, yeah, well. So I brought this art into this world, and I'm taking it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and by remaining anonymous, mm-hmm. he controls the way it is consumed. Oh, yeah. I For all you know, I am Banksy. I'm pretty sure you're not. But for <laughs> all you know, I am. Uh, let's talk about the possibilities with AI that are good the opportunities that AI presents. First of all, there are new creative possibilities. I think the big thing that most people mention is, is like, oh no, we're going to hurt artists, but AI can act as a tool for artists. It's going to create jobs. People, like I said before, AI is no, it's only as good as you can prompt it. And Mm -hmm. there, there is an art form to that. There is a work to it. Um, It'll offer us new ways to explore creativity. It'll push boundaries. It can help generate ideas and provide inspiration. So for me, that's how, how, how I use it for radio content. It helps provide inspiration because sometimes I'm just too tired to come up with more ideas. I need help coming up with ideas. I'll, I'll flesh out the idea, but just give me an idea because my brain is tired. Um, I'm working. <laughs> I can't help you. Can't do it all, Dave. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you know what I'm saying? Yes. It creates possibilities, I think. Yes. And so I definitely think that there are some very cool creative things that can happen. And I think within that creativity, you're also going to see potentially some cost effective ways to do things. And so like we had talked about with that movie that I watched earlier, if the AI prompts would have been a little bit better if AI would have been maybe a couple of years more down the road. No one might, might have noticed in this small production company would not have gotten dragged across social media lightly, but they did get dragged for their use of AI. Uh, the, the next thing is, is it increases accessibility. What I mean by that is think about maybe a kid who doesn't feel artistic. They can't draw. Like if you were like me, I couldn't draw. I still can't draw. I can't paint. I can't even play musical instruments. I I, tried to play the most simplest one, the trumpet only has three buttons. And it was just, my brain doesn't work that way. Well, Dave, that's because you are still going to advance. There's a thing called the (laughs) handbells. You could have done that one, buddy. Too complicated, man. (laughs) Uh, But AI can sort of democratize, I guess, if that makes sense, art by making creative tools more accessible to a larger group of people, right? So if someone can figure out a prompt, who's to say they can't make something original with AI? But then we're getting back into, well, where's the AI getting its information from? Mm -hmm. Like, it seems like they're, you got to figure out a way 
where AI can only peruse like free use stuff or stuff that's so old and has been around public domain. Yes. So if art past a certain date is just public domain and it can draw from that, that's great. Fine. Uh, but I, I think it can increase accessibility for people to be artistic, to be creators. But you got, we got to figure out some way to cut down on copyright infringement. I just got done watching this reels of uh, Winona Ryder. She was in the Criterion Library of Movies. So all the movies that have ever been made by Criterion. She's listing out her favorites that are there. And I had heard about four of the eight she listed. Criterion movies tend to be more indie, tend to be more artsy. But they're usually well done. They're quality. And so, like, even if you think if it's being borrowed from some no name, it's not a big deal. Well, it could be like super influential and could be super impactful for that particular artist. There are singers that you and I have not heard of, but they're like, oh, that individual, they know how to songwrite and uh, they make such lovely music and it's inspirational to them. And then they make these inspirational songs that everyone adores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The last thing that I think AI brings to the table is I think it's going to revolutionize work, the way we work, how we work, what we do. Um, obviously it's going to en enhance efficiency. I think AI is going to streamline that things that used to be time consuming. Oh yeah. Uh, once we learn how to really nail it down and, um, uh, learn how to use it better. And in the creative process, as far as pop culture goes, I think editing the technical stuff, background music. I mean, just, just, just all these technical things that go on in the creation of our pop culture, the things that we love, that's probably really time consuming. It may revolutionize that. Now I tend to think that when these experts say, well, this is going to replace two thirds of the workforce in the next 10 to 15 years. That's not exactly scary to me because AI solving. That's not the problem. That's mm -hmm. actually good. Freeing up two thirds of people to do something different. I don't think is the problem, the prop because, because here's the deal. The products are still moving. Money's still moving. Money is still being made. The problem that needs to be fixed is human greed. Because if the money's still going to like the corporate centers, as I talked about earlier, then yeah, those two thirds of the people who are out of a job, that's going to be a problem. So, and I know this is going to sound utopia I, and I know <laughs> that it's going to be ridiculous, but it seems like if socialism was ever going to work, which I, I doubt it could, and not because of what people say, but because humanity is greedy. That's why all governments don't really work because humanity is greedy. But if we weren't going to be just one time, if we were going to do something right, AI might be the missing component. I'm going to say no. I know uh, but, that's what that, cause that's the answer that makes sense. <laughs> well, and I also think if you freed up two thirds of the world, there's a big issue and it's a catastrophic issue and mm -hmm. it would be yeah. catastrophic to their mental health potentially. So a lot of people find meaning or find through the, their work, they find meaning in their life. It Absolutely. gives them a sense of Absolutely. purpose. And it might not be their full meaning. It might just be a chunk because family might take up a chunk. Um, if you're part of a faith denomination, that might take up a chunk. Friends, whatever. Work is something that has always been foreseeably should be something that motivates us. Um, yes, I agree. And so, like... You got to have something that replaces that. You got to keep people moving. You got to keep people motivated because we think life is bad now, even though that we're living in the safest time ever. We will think it's so much worse. Yeah. And, and to be fair, in a perfect world, what I'm thinking is, is not that you just have two thirds of the workforce freed up and doing nothing. Is that they would be freed up to do 
something different, go into business for themselves, um, create their own work. You know what I'm saying? Um, play college football. <laughs> that's what a lot of people would probably do. And in that case, you're probably right. It's not healthy. But that I saved this for the last intentionally because there is an extremely unhealthy component to all of this. And you hit on it there with work. For a lot of us, work is our social mm-hmm. output. We go and work among our peers, and those are kind of our social output for the bulk of our day. Um, and even for kids, because kids will say, like, school is work. It's awful. There's a huge component to school, and that is the socialization well, aspect. Think about, think about AI teachers. And if you haven't, it's a you thing. should be. Because that seems like a possibility. Mm-hmm. Especially since we're having teacher shortages, yeah. um, the cost of education. It's a thankless job it a is. lot these days. Kids yell and are rude, yeah. allegedly. Well, I know that for a fact, but yeah. like, yes. Here, here, yeah. Okay, go ahead. So, you got a thought? I, I have one other thing to tack on to the AI thing. And I wonder I, if we're about to say the same thing. I don't think so. Unless you watched the video I had sent you earlier today of, that Daniel Tosh conducted the interview. I did watch that. Okay. So AI, again, it, there is a lot of potential good. And for every fullness that may be found there's a whole nother level of emptiness that may be sought yes. after mm-hmm. and in this interview that i sent dave um it talked about like well you can use ai to harm other people you can use ai to wipe out other people all you have to do is say go track down this person and a drone then seeks out this person i mean we are at the stage of a lot of our technology that we thought a few years ago was, oh, you'll never see that in our neck of the woods because we live in small rural population that's impoverished. There's drones. People have drones in yeah. our community. Yeah. Um, people have really nice computers in our community. Um, farmers have big drones. Farmers have massive drones. And so we're at a stage where we really do have to be thinking about the mental and physical ramifications of how we proceed with AI because there is a lot of good, but there's always people out there that are going to look for the worst possible ways to use this. And we have to be... I think ever more connected to each other to make sure that people that might fall through the gaps that might feel like outcasts that might want to cause harm to others. They don't feel that way. I didn't think our two, our major concerns were going to connect until right there at the end. Boom. My concern with AI is connection. Technology has already shown a propensity to lessen our connection. It appears that we're yeah. more connected, but it is superficial. Yeah, All the numbers will back this up that say we are generally unhappier since the invention of the smartphone. We have less times with companions, friends, uh, less face to face time. And I think what we're finding out is that has a direct effect on our moods and our well-being. And you being in mental health could probably back that up. My concern is that. We're not going to stop here with AI. We're going to try and replace companionship completely because AI, you can have a conversation with it. And if you can have a conversation with it, we'll try to put it in like, it's all the futuristic things we, we watch growing up. There'll be robots. There'll be androids with AI. Um, there already are some that they're not perfect, but it's yeah. a lot further advanced than I thought we were at. And I don't I'm, I don't think it's going to be a horror movie. I don't think it's going to be Terminator. Yeah. I think that's silly science fiction-y stuff. My main concern is, will we try to replace human companionship? Will some people try to com- completely replace that with this technology? And the answer, I think, is, yeah, some people will do that. And I think it'll have drastic effects. Drastic. You think depression's bad now. 
Mm -hmm. I think it just it just gets worse if we go that direction. And so that's my major concern with AI. Stay connected, people. Stay connected. Speaking of staying connected, you should follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and X and Instagram, even the TikTok. One of these days, I want to download that app. Yeah, you should just wait. It'll probably be illegal soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should follow us on those. As always, subscribe to the pod. If you're not subscribed, share the pod. We're growing again. We went through kind of a static period for a while, but we are back to growing. We've had a lot of downloads in the last few weeks. A lot of people are discovering the pod right now. We're going to be at the ICT Comic Con and Science Fiction Expo in Wichita this weekend. Not to be confused with the ICP convention. No, no we are not hanging with the Juggalos. Well, there might be Juggalos there. But not the same convention. <laughs> Come see us if you're in the area in Wichita this weekend. And uh, yeah, just take care of yourselves. We love you guys. We love uh, everyone who takes time to listen to this. We're so honored to be able to do this. And we, uh, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time. Thank you.